Okay, thanks, John, very much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, dialing in today and, and listening to uh, a little bit about hail. It doesn't feel like severe weather outside, but uh, maybe this will uh, get us a little bit in the mood here. Uh, today I'm joined uh, by uh, Derek Derosh. He's in the uh, office with us today. And, and I'd also uh, need to thank all the co-authors that were involved in this, uh, Derek, uh, Josh Bowstead in Omaha, Jared Layton in uh, Topeka, Brian Bargenbrook, and Bill Gargan also in Topeka. Uh, each one of these co-authors uh, did a tremendous amount of work uh, over about a two-year period. And uh, we literally had hundreds upon hundreds of, of hours of radar data to go through. So uh, uh, this would not at all have been possible uh, without everybody's uh, hard work. So we'll go ahead and jump in and uh, take a look at uh, just some definitions initially. And uh, everybody's pretty much familiar with what we call severe hail. So one inch in diameter is what uh, wording we would use for severe. Uh, for the purpose of the rest of the presentation, significant hail we'll go ahead and define as uh, two inches in diameter. Uh, that was, I think, at least first initially defined formally in literature by Hales in 98. And uh, still to this day, Storm Prediction Center uses uh, the two inch hail uh, criteria for their hatched uh, hail outlooks. And then we'll go ahead and what most of the talk will be focusing on is uh, giant hail. And that's uh, four inches in diameter. And uh, that was first defined by the Knights in uh, 2001, and uh, we'll stick with that uh, terminology there. So giant hail, when we refer to that, just simply means uh, four inches or greater. So uh, an overview uh, of giant hail, it's, it's a relatively infrequent phenomenon. When we go back and look at uh, storm data and look at the United States hail reports, uh, this type of hail accounts for less than 1% of uh, the hail reports out there. Uh, with that said, though, uh, a lot of the giant hail is likely underrepresented in storm data. And this is due to a lot of reasons. Uh, the first reason, of course, is a lot of these storms uh, simply occur in rural areas. And uh, we simply just don't have the people there, for one, to report uh, that, tor that type of hail uh, back to us. Number two, uh, the Weather Service uh, has certainly a very high workload uh, during severe weather, and, and certainly one of our goals is, is, a, is not to have widespread aggressive spatial verification. Uh, we do a pretty good job with verification with warnings, but the verification we're talking with is to actually satisfy uh, scientific studies. And uh, the verification database that we have uh, traditionally does not support uh, th uh, that nature. Uh, the type of hail with giant hail has the potential to cause at least extreme damage to property and a substantial threat to any exposed life, whether it be people out at a concert or uh, agriculture interest uh, out in the Plains states. Uh, uh, this type of hail, uh, generally speaking, hitting the right part in the head or whatnot will cause uh, severe injuries, if not a fatality. Uh, so when it's important when we consider that not all severe is equal. Uh, the response, the urgency of our partners are frequently heightened uh, when giant hail is imminent or occurring. And uh, so if we have giant hail in the forecast in our short-term warning operations. The response is, is certainly much more significant in most cases than a, uh, a one-inch hail type storm. So where are we at operationally? Well, the prediction of giant hail and really hail size in general has been challenging. Uh, we've made some very good strides uh, over the last 20 years, but still, uh, Getting real good, precise hail forecast remains a big challenge. And, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. So the real need, there's a need out there to be able to identify uh, specific signatures of giant hail producing storms uh, to improve that detection and hopefully some advanced recognition uh, of those events. Uh, the other thing that this study does that we were able to do is it benefits from uh, investigating the upper known threshold of hail reports. Uh, whereas a lot of previous hail studies would take a big range of hail sizes uh, and then uh, try to make uh, radar-based signatures from that, uh, there was a, a large uncertainty whether or not storm data captured the actual maximum hail size. Uh, by investigating at least a very high threshold of four inches or greater, or greater you remove that uncertainty uh, where either a, a larger hailstone went unreported in the storm or whatnot. So you, you start being able to look at a little bit cleaner signal uh, when you're looking at the higher threshold of events. So we'll take a look first at uh, 
the Storm Prediction Center uh, and their ability to, to forecast giant hail before it occurs, and of course these watches were out before uh, any severe weather or any giant hail was reported with a storm. And what you're seeing here in the red uh, is, is many events forecasted in the watches from the Storm Prediction Center uh, and the maximum hail size that was in the watch. Uh, the blue is the actual giant hail size uh, that occurred within that watch. Uh, and as you can see, uh, most of Storm Prediction Center's watches uh, centered around two inches or greater uh, with uh, two and a half or three inches, not all that uncommon either. Um, when it comes to actually giant hail, though, four inches or greater, uh, prior to that report coming in, uh, the Storm Prediction Center uh, had 8% of their watches uh, forecasting that size of hail. Uh, so the average underestimated size over this five-year period uh, was a little over an inch and a half. Uh, and this isn't honestly too bad. Uh, two to three inch hail forecast in most of these supercellular environments. And, and again, that's something that we'll touch on throughout the talk is actually talking about how uh, supercells are responsible for, for much of the hail two inches and greater. All right, when we take a look at the uh, a five year uh, forecast evaluation from the National Weather Service, Again, it's the same uh, color codes with uh, red, the forecasted uh, hail size and the warnings uh, and follow-up statements, uh, with the blue actually being the uh, actual hail size that occurred four inches or greater in some cases. And uh, what we see here, or I should mention first, that uh, in, in the Weather Service warnings, if an initial warning went out with a smaller hail size and a follow-up statement with an SVS, uh, came out with uh, a larger hail size, the larger hail size was used. Um, so, uh, you know, essentially as long as whatever product was out there with the largest hail size is what was used in this graphic uh, before a hail report was received. Um, so what we see here is that uh, only 7% of the time uh, we were able to uh, uh, accurately forecast uh, hail sizes uh, before, uh, before a four inch occurred. Uh, the average underestimated size uh, was 2.19 inches, so a little over two inches in diameter under forecasted. And again, this illustrates the challenge of, of being able to forecast this type of hail. 23% uh, of the Weather Service warnings uh, forecasted penny to quarter sized hail. And I think that's something, if, if anything we take away from this, this is something we want to try to avoid. Uh, as we'll see with these types of storms, uh, there should be enough of a signal to at least go higher uh, than penny to quarter sized tail in the warning. So that, that's kind of a big number there. Um, and, and it's certainly possible that things like workload and, uh, you know, not timely follow-up statements, whatever might have, might have created that uh, situation, uh, you know, might have played a role in that. Uh, another thing on that is 26% of the giant hail events uh, were associated with tornado warnings. So about, uh, you know, one out of five or so or uh, rather one out of four uh, had, uh, had uh, tornado warnings associated with that. Uh, most Weather Service tornado warnings contained uh, no hail size information. And I know, at least in Central Region, we've rectified that a little bit uh, by having uh, hail information on, on our tags at the bottom of our warnings. So uh, that will change, but during the, the sample here that we had, uh, uh, a lot of times there was no warning or no hail information under tornado warnings. Uh, if you'll notice, the Weather Service had a tendency to, uh, to a lot of times use golf ball and, ba and baseball sized hail to convey uh, large hail. So you can kind of see frequent uh, increments of 1.75 and 2.75 uh, inch hail uh, that was frequently used to convey, one would assume, large hail. Uh, there were very few cases, too, where it appeared that uh, the Weather Service overestimated. There was definitely a a conservative approach when it came to, to hail size forecasting. Um, so we'll just take a quick look at an abbreviated methodology uh, that we were able to, to put together here. Um, generally speaking with the ADAD data and some of the storm data uh, items that we used, uh, 568 uh, storm data giant hail reports uh, were incorporated in the study from a 15 year period from 95 to the end of 2009. Um, the closest uh, RDA site was used and then a secondary uh, radar site was used uh, in order to accomplish the, both the low and storm, storm top 
uh, of, of each storm. Uh, so we tried to use at least uh, two radar sites if possible. Um, the radar examined, or the radar data examined, uh, was 15 minutes prior to the report and five minutes after the report time. And uh, that methodology was taken um, from some previous literature work that, that aligns with, with that type of uh, uh, sample period. So that what that allows us to do is, is get us four full volumes, depending on the VCP uh, scanning strategy. Uh, we definitely QC'd storm data report times and the location. Uh, in this particular study, we saw that the time of the reports uh, were frequently incorrect uh, in storm data versus uh, what, what uh, the radar would suggest. In fact, 24% of the cases were uh, uh, actually had no reflectivity uh, associated with the report time. Uh, most times the uh, storm was, was downstream of the report. Uh, so we did apply a correction scheme that was, again, used from some previous literature work. Uh, and in cases that uh, we weren't able to resolve uh, any discrepancies, just the case was uh, thrown out. Um, additionally, cases were also removed when uh, reports were uh, greater than 185 kilometers from the RDA or too close in within 30 miles of the radar uh, where subsequent radars weren't able to be used. Um, once we got all that radar data, we were able to vertically interpolate that. And then we also used the, uh, the NAR environmental data for our temperature heights. Um, from that, we uh, created a comparison database uh, using both storm data and shave uh, to look at uh, both four-inch hail versus, let's say, golf ball to hen egg size, which would be 1.75 to two inches in diameter. And then we also wanted to make sure that uh, looking at the slightly lower resolution of reports with storm data uh, had similar signals to a higher resolution report database with shave. So that was another type of comparison that we looked at and that we'll look at here in a little bit. Uh, and then analysis was, was performed on an additional 174 cases, uh, and the breakdown there is at the bottom of the screen with uh, 28 giant hail reports from shave, 67 golf ball hen egg reports from storm data, and then 79 golf ball hen egg reports from shave. So again, that's, that's just a quick uh, summary of the methodology. There was certainly more that went in that, and we can uh, entertain any questions if you have them uh, after the talk. Okay, so taking a look at the, uh, the big picture, uh, again, data was used over a 15-year period across the entire CONUS, and uh, this is just the distribution uh, on the top image of giant hail reports uh, that were incorporated in the study. And there, there isn't a whole lot of surprise with uh, the highest uh, areas of occurrence during that 15-year period being across the uh, central and southern plain states, especially the high plains. Uh, but certainly it's interesting to point out, too, that uh, it's not just a phenomenon that occurs out in the plains. It uh, stretches well into the uh, lower Mississippi Valley and, and southeast as well. Um, at the bottom, uh, we can see that uh, the shave reports uh, that uh, were used as well as the uh, uh, golf ball hen egg reports from storm data, the color codes on the legend are on the bottom left of that. And just to give you an idea, again, of, of where we used reports for that uh, comparison database. So we won't spend a whole long, long time on this, but just uh, the giant hail climatology, in case anybody's interested, again, during that 15-year uh, period, uh, the monthly and the hourly distributions of this closely mirror what you'd expect for the uh, climatological period for supercell storms, especially in the plain states. So when we look at the events per month, uh, we see a tremendous increase uh, in, in giant hail events from April through July. Uh, with, well, of course, lesser occurrences during the uh, summer and winter months. And the same goes true for the time of, time of day, uh, actually, where we see, you know, late afternoon into their early evening hours, uh, one of the most uh, uh, prime periods for, for giant hail occurrence. And again, this, this should suggest that uh, giant hail is closely aligned uh, with supercell-type storms. And, and again, there's some literature here at the bottom that suggests that uh, some previous studies show that storms producing two-inch hail or greater are almost exclusively uh, with those supercell-type storms. So what we have here is a uh, that we created uh, to just uh, kind of a cheat sheet, if you will, to get a good gauge when you're working operations uh, whether or not you should be anticipating four-inch hail or perhaps 
uh, smaller hail, but still significant in the order of two inches. So uh, that's what we have here. And, and throughout the rest of the talk, we'll kind of go through uh, this worksheet step by step and, and show the background of, of where we were able to, uh, to come from these numbers here. So if you were to use this worksheet in real time, the very first thing that uh, you'd want to do uh, is select uh, your, your area of concern and fill out your temperature heights in your threat area. Uh, so what we have, the five items listed here would be uh, your wet bulb zero height, uh, your freezing level, your minus 10, minus 20, and minus 30. Again, some of that is critical, whether it's uh, the melting of hail as it falls uh, in the, that level or versus the, the hail growth zone uh, between the minus 10 and minus 30 range. So we at least want to have a good start of environmental uh, parameters uh, before, we, before we dive too deep in that. So that would be the first step using the worksheet. And then the second, second step would be to gauge uh, your anticipated storm organization, whether it's uh, occurring now or whether you're anticipating it with time, uh, just to get an idea of what types of storms you're, you're expecting. Uh, so in cases where we have poor to fair storm organization, whether it be uh, single cell type storms, multi-cell storms, but no real uh, discernible rotation, uh, you know, something along the lines of the Donovan method, or uh, I know a lot of people have local hail studies, something along those lines would work pretty well. Um, uh, and again, you can see the chart on the right, uh, that's just the Donovan one inch hail uh, criteria there with the wet bulb zero height on the left and the 50 dBZ warning criteria on the right. Uh, so that might be an okay approach, and there's a line there to, to write in uh, what Donovan uh, height you might be using, but again, some local hail studies might also work uh, just as well for that. Um, now, in cases where you start getting some moderate to even really good storm organization, and this is when we're talking about supercell type storms with uh, some very obvious mid-level rotation, uh, the methods that we found in our research might be uh, useful at that point. So we'll go through that. And the very first thing for for giant hail that we have is that supercells accounted for 99% of all these cases out of 600 cases, 99% uh, of them were supercell storms. Um, so the thing to look for uh, first off and foremost is a persistent, uh, well-organized supercell storm structure. Uh, we want to see a presence of a, of a good moderate to large beware. And when we look at storm structure, again, this is the type of uh, thing we would love to see for a four-inch type storm. Uh, this is just some cross sections and, and to get an idea of, of what we're referring to when we're talking about a really nice bounded weak echo region. Uh, and again, 99% of these storms were uh, some form of supercell storms. Uh, the 1% uh, was some sort of squall line and some other really strange looking storms on radar. Um, you know, in storm data it had four inch hail, there was a description with it, hard to say whether it was or if it wasn't. but just for that uncertainty, there's, there's still, I guess, an outside chance, a 1% chance that you may not have a supercell storm. But, but really, when you're anticipating this, you should be thinking supercells. Now, the importance of the BWER, uh, you know, indicates you want to see that wide and strong updraft. And that's going to typically, con sorry, typically contain a large amount of supercooled uh, cloud water along the outskirts of that BWER summit, where the uh, vertical velocities are so strong it's evacuating a lot of the hydrometeors, but on the outskirts of that, uh, you really have a, a prime environment for uh, uh, supporting large hail growth. Uh, when we take a look at the breakdown of uh, which ones were mesocyclonic or anti-mesocyclonic, we can see that uh, the large majority were right movers, or 88% were the uh, mesocyclonic type storms. Uh, but certainly we did still see a percentage of uh, left-moving storms uh, that also produced giant hail, and, and those are also notorious for uh, being hail producers. So um, I, I don't know if I would necessarily read a whole lot in that. I would just say that both a left and right split type storm, uh, if it has the other type of parameters in addition to a nice B word that we're going to be discussing later, uh, it certainly has the potential for uh, giant hail. All right, when we take a look at just some different views of BWERs from different distances from, from the radar range, uh, this is one storm that produced uh, really large hail over a large swath uh, across the Wichita metropolitan area uh, back in 2010. And we can see the different views uh, from the RDAs uh, to the BWER. 
Uh, of course, the top left is out of Wichita. It's only 17 miles from the, uh, the radar site. And uh, you can see just an absolutely uh, beautiful uh, uh, weak echo region in this slice here. And uh, I should mention that all these are about 20 to 25,000 feet uh, AGL uh, from, from the uh, radar site. So again, we're looking all at all of these in the mid-levels. Uh, when we get further away from the storms, such as uh, Dodge City or Topeka, where we're roughly 120 miles from the radar, and this is also very close to the inbound of, of what we actually included in the study, uh, you can still infer a very good uh, weak echo region uh, with that B-Ware in the storm. And then a little bit closer, advanced 70 miles again, you can still see a, a very strong signal. So this is what we're talking about when we're referring to really solid uh, storm structure with the, uh, with the inclusion of a, a B-Ware type structure. Okay, the next step that uh, we'd be wanting to look at, uh, in addition to that really good storm structure, is a strong mid-level rotation. And uh, what we have here is the peak rotational velocity, and you can uh, see the formula there, simply the uh, absolute values of the uh, maximum inbound and outbound. And then we, important here, we divide that by two uh, to get the peak rotational velocity. If you're in the heat of the moment and you don't want to divide things by two, we also have uh, uh, total velocity there on the side. So your V sub R is going to be, you're going to want it between 40 and 60 knots. Uh, for your four-inch hail producing storms. Again, that's 80 to 120 knots of total shear. Uh, and you can see on the uh, golf ball to hen egg cases, we had a little bit less than that, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 45 knots. And, and we'll look into that there. But the other thing, too, is that we want to use uh, our, uh, our, our meso should be less than 15 kilometers across. And we also want to avoid any low-level type tornadic vortex signatures that, that might contribute to higher velocity values. Uh, from actually a, a TVS type signature. So we're looking here in the mid-levels. So when we look at the, uh, the box and whisker chart here, uh, we can see uh, where the, the spread is from the cases. And, and generally speaking, again, that, that 40 to 60 knot range, uh, the, the graph here is in meters per second. But uh, what we want, again, is somewhere in the, the 40 to 60 knot of V sub R. Uh, the median with that was about 48 knots. And the average height in most of these cases that we had uh, was around uh, 20,000 feet. So the, the reason behind this, and the reason this is such a strong discriminator, and we'll, we'll show this here in a little bit, is the supercell itself, the effects of storm rotation uh, maintain that storm structure and updraft propagation through that inherent vertical pressure perturbation associated with the updraft region. So the vertical pressure gradient forces induced by that rotation uh, actually have a greater uh, vertical acceleration than you would get with your uh, instability or your buoyancy alone. So even in cases that are uh, favorable for supercells but maybe not a whole lot of cape, uh, with very strong mid-level rotation, you can compensate some for that and have a, a very strong updraft uh, simply through that vertical pressure gradient force. Um, there was a paper in, in 88 by Miller that also showed that uh, the giant hail was well correlated to the president's presence of that mid-level mesocyclone. Uh, and he showed some favorable growth trajectories uh, in specific regions of that updraft based upon uh, the mid-level rotation. So uh, there's a lot going on, but uh, it, one of our strongest discriminators uh, that we showed, uh, or at least that was shown from our research, was uh, the presence of a moderate to strong uh, mesocyclone. Okay, so the next thing uh, that we looked at that was a fairly decent discriminator was uh, storm top divergence. Uh, and again, that's just the, uh, the max, and, and, uh, max and min values to and from the radar site, uh, absolute value of that. And we saw uh, 120 to 180 knots uh, of total velocity with that. And we'll take a look at, uh, again, the breakdown in the box and whisker here. And uh, again, the storm top divergence, you want that strong upper divergent flow in the, in the storm. It's a good proxy for updraft, updraft strength. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be suggestive to a radar operator that, again, the stronger the, the storm divergence at the summit, the, uh, the stronger you can infer the updraft. Um, there are some inherent limitations with the storm top divergence uh, that can be a little tricky, especially uh, uh, when you get further from the radar. Uh, once you get further from the radar, we start getting more gaps between elevation angles. 
Uh, we start getting into beam broadening, uh, and uh, that can that can cause some trickiness, if you will, when you're uh, doing your analysis. Uh, the uh, one slice of the radar might not necessarily be the max of the end or the outbound of the radar. You might actually have to use uh, two different elevation angles uh, to get that uh, max storm top divergence. Uh, so they can be time consuming at times. Uh, the other thing you have to really watch out for uh, that we threw out, we had uh, anything 10 dBZ or lower, uh, we threw out that velocity data as uh, the lower, lower values of reflectivity start getting the potential at least for some corrupted uh, velocity. Um, so definitely use caution with that as well if, if you're using that. Uh, but again, you want to see storm top divergence at least somewhere greater than 120 knots. Uh, the median in this case is 140, and there certainly are going to be situations where you might see it higher than that. All right, when we take a look at the comparison database and, and look at thing, how things break down, uh, what we have in these box and whiskers, uh, what we just finished showing, showing you here on the, on the left, their peak visa var, and on the right, your storm top divergence. The box and whisker in green is the 568 cases from storm data. Uh, the box in red is the golf ball hen egg cases from storm data. And then we wanted to also look how shave broke down. So shave, giant hail cases are in the light blue. And then the shave cases of the golf ball and hen egg sizes are in the purple. And the first thing you should see on both your peak uh, rotational velocity and your storm top divergence is that there's definitely minimal overlap between the giant hail and the golf ball hen egg events. Uh, the other thing we see is that in this particular case, uh, shave would validate uh, the findings that we had from uh, your slightly lower resolution of reports with storm data as well. Uh, lastly, we conducted a uh, null hypothesis student's t-test, uh, and uh, we did see that these uh, differences were statistically significant uh, up to a 99% confidence level. So again, your, your peak rotational velocity and your peak storm top divergence are going to be very, very strong discriminators of getting something on the order of giant hail uh, versus maybe golf ball hen egg, and especially if you still have that strong, B, uh, strong supercell structure, a nice wide beware. Again, a lot of this is interrelated. You don't want to use one piece or another uh, without using the whole, whole uh, uh, plethora of variables that we're showing here, but uh, uh, these two here were particularly promising for discriminating uh, these size uh, hail sizes. Okay, so the next thing we looked at is the uh, the the max, uh, or I should say, the peak 50 dBZ height, as well as the uh, 60 dBZ height in the storm, and uh, and we did that both for the giant hail and the golf ball hen egg cases, and uh, we'll take a look at those right now. Uh, this is, again, just the giant hail cases and the distribution of that. Uh, and this is 50 dBZ heights all the way to 55, 60, 65, 70, and 75 dBZ heights. And as you would expect, there's a gradual decrease throughout the storm on this. Uh, the average 50 dBZ height was around 40,000 feet, uh, with the average uh, 60 dBZ height, or I should say the median, uh, was around uh, 35,000 feet. Um, so that's just a general idea of the types of, of heights that we would have with reflectivity. Again, there's some trickiness to this. Uh, the uh, radar essentially, the radar center beam estimates, when we're getting further from the radar and higher up uh, with the beam broadening, we, we start having some potential uh, for errors on the, if you will, this implied precision of actual heights. And uh, throwing in the mix of that could be special cases where you have strong sub or super refraction of the radar beam, uh, as well as especially seasonal variability. That's going to change uh, these heights as well. So um, when you're thinking these heights, uh, you, you must consider uh, the, the quality of how the radar is sampling it, your environment, and also especially your seasonal variability. And uh, we see that example of seasonal variability uh, when we look at uh, the similar graph that we showed earlier with looking at the different uh, hail sizes as well as storm data and shave. And when you look at just simply storm data uh, of the four inch hail versus the golf ball hen egg, you can see again there's, there's minimal overlap, especially from 50, 55, and 60 dBZ heights. However, when you compare the shave data to that, or I should say if you look at just shave, again there's very minimal overlap 
between shaved four-inch hail and golf ball in hen egg cases. But when you compare the storm data versus the shave, you start seeing a lot more overlap uh, where the signal's muted. And, and the main reason we believe for this is simply that shave operates during a very limited time of the year, uh, May, June, July especially, uh, when we would start anticipating to see some of these highest storm tops uh, versus storm data where we incorporated a, a year-round seasonal type uh, uh, look at the storms. So I guess what I would say is that, uh, you know, while specific maximum reflectivity heights uh, cannot be directly correlated to the, your probability of giant hail occurrence, in most of these cases, these giant hail producing storms were frequently characterized by higher reflectivity heights than storms that produced those smaller hail sizes. The key is the relative to the time of the year. Uh, so if you're looking at kind of a May-June type scenario, you may want to bump up those values that we have in the worksheet closer to what you're seeing uh, on the shave graphs uh, here, as you would expect to see a higher 50 and 60 dBZ uh, storm height. The next step we're looking at here is, is the reflectivity uh, greater than, than 60 dBZ. Uh, that's what we want to see, is reflectivity greater than 60 dBZ uh, through that preferred hail growth zone. So that's the, the next step here uh, on the worksheet. Uh, when we go forward here, uh, what we see is that uh, the, the, the four, or I should say the reflectivity at the significant temperature levels, again, 0, minus 10, minus 20, and minus 30, ends up being a poor discriminator between giant hail and the golf ball hen egg sizes. Uh, but not all is lost in this. Uh, what we still expect for both types of hail events is we want to see reflectivity greater than 60 dBZ throughout that preferred growth zone. Uh, for the giant hail, uh, we, we saw a median of actually 65 dBZ uh, throughout pretty much the entire uh, hail growth zone. In fact, maybe a little higher than that even. So um, the, the takeaway point here is that whether you're looking at golf ball hen egg type storms or giant hail storms, you should at least anticipate uh, pretty good reflectivity through that hail growth zone of minus 10 to minus 30 in fact, somewhere in the neighborhood of probably close to, to 65 dBZ. Okay, now we're heading towards the, uh, the bottom of the worksheet. And uh, we just have some final notes here of some of the other findings that, uh, that we found on our research here. And I'll, I'll start off with uh, the first note here, and that's the maximum reflectivity within the radar volume, so our, our max uh, reflectivity throughout every elevation slice, uh, the three-body signature, uh, uh, three, sorry, three-body uh, spike signatures, or TBSS, and uh, bill-based products showed uh, no skill, actually, in discriminating storms producing two-inch hail versus four-inch hail. Uh, so the, the takeaway point on that is that these methods should not be used, actually, as hail size predictors. It's not necessarily saying that they're not good hail indicators, but they're, they're not good hail size predictors. Uh, we touched on this a little bit ago, but avoid using any low-level or, or something you believe might be some sort of TBS signature in the velocity uh, for values you're using for V sub R, uh, you really want, again, that, that mid-level mesocyclone, target, target that area. And uh, again, try to be uh, maybe not as conservative uh, with predicting max hail size when, when you're dealing with these supercell type storms. A lot of times there's just not sufficient ground truth out there and if you're relying on that ground truth, it's unlikely that in all cases you're going to have supportive ground truth when there actually really is three, four, or even larger hail type occurring. We'll show some of the breakdown of, uh, of, uh, of the notes that we just discussed. And uh, the first thing that we have here is, is the maximum reflectivity within the radar volume. And as you can see here from both the four-inch hail and let's just say the two-inch hail cases, uh, there's, there's very little uh, signal throughout. In fact, there's actually a somewhat decrease in signal with uh, the storm data's uh, four-inch hail of maximum reflectivity. And, and some of that might make sense. Again, the radar uh, reflectivity is, is looking both at the diameter when it's calculating, but also the concentration. Those two things play the role in dictating your, your reflectivity. And a lot of times with this four-inch hail and four-inch hail type storms, we simply don't have very high reflectivity uh, in the storm. So if you're anticipating seeing something on the order of, you know, 75 dBZ indicates really huge hail, 
it's probably not going to happen. All right, the other thing we looked at is our uh, three-body scatter spike. And uh, this was a little surprising to us, uh, about half and half, if you will, the cases uh, where we had a slightly more negative uh, occurrences of a TBSS versus a uh, actual identified TBSS uh, signature. Um, the, the footnote to that is that there were a lot of cases where downrange echoes uh, likely masked what we would have seen a, a TBSS. So there were probably a few more cases that did have a three-body scatter spike a signature with them, uh, but it certainly wasn't a, an overwhelming number that would somehow lead you to believe that you need to look for this signature in order to get four-inch hail in a storm. Okay, then lastly, we looked at uh, digital VIL and VIL density. Digital VIL is on the left and, and VIL density is on the right. And again, the same breakdown on the box and whisker charts. charts. And as you can see here, uh, not a whole lot of signal uh, with that. And this has been shown back in 98 by uh, Edwards and Thompson that uh, at least the original VIL was, was a poor discriminator of, of hail size. And uh, this continues along those same lines that uh, uh, VIL is probably not going to steer you in a very good way for uh, uh, discriminating actual hail sizes. All right, the last piece of the talk we're going to look at is just some giant hail examples. And uh, we grabbed this chart here from a recent paper that uh, myself and Jared published uh, in the NWA's electronic journal. Uh, and uh, what, what we put together here is actually the, if you will, the top five certified uh, giant hail, or the largest hail in the U.S. to actually be documented with uh, photographic evidence. So, of course, Vivian is, is number one uh, with uh, some six-inch cases tied in, in fifth place down at the bottom. And we'll look at a lot of these cases. Uh, Vivian and Meadville, Missouri, uh, will skip because they were simply too far uh, from the radar range to have a real good uh, clean signal. Uh, even so, they were still very impressive on uh, radar. But if anybody's ever looking for a chart, that shows the, the largest known uh, recorded hail sizes, uh, this, this is a good chart to use. All right, so uh, one that probably all of us are pretty familiar with was back in 03 when we finally had the old Coffeyville stone record broken, and that was uh, Aurora, Nebraska here, uh, where we had a 7-inch diameter hailstone. And uh, what we're looking here on the left is just the half-degree reflectivity out of Hastings, and then the, the middle and right panels, if you will, uh, are at 26, or at least the center of the storm is at 26,000 feet, uh, respectively at the 6.2 degree elevation angle. Uh, so as we see here, uh, you know, a pretty nice looking storm at the half degree, and then at the mid levels, again, your B-Wer or your weak echo region in this case is, is, is noted and at, at 26,000 feet, uh, right over Aurora, as we see there. And again, not a whole lot of high reflectivity, you should point out as well. Uh, when we look at the mid-level rotation in this storm, uh, it was highly impressive. Uh, we're looking at, again, a V sub R value, and again, that's divided by two from the total velocity of 80 knots. And if you remember on the, on the chart, we actually give a range of somewhere on the, on the order of 40 to 60 knots uh, of V sub R was, was our range that we had been seeing a lot of the four-inch hail-type storms. So uh, this should have uh, provided a lot of confidence in this case here uh, that this storm would be potentially a, a giant hail producer. Uh, looking at some other examples, this one's from August, uh, up in southeastern uh, South Dakota near uh, Dante, uh, where we had just shy of 7-inch hail. And again, kind of the similar type of uh, storm features that we saw with Aurora, uh, half degree here, uh, showing a very nice tight reflectivity gradient at the low levels, uh, but not real high reflectivity. Uh, Higher up and looking at the beware structure at 27,000 feet, uh, we can see, you know, again, real nice uh, wide updraft. And again, really strong mid-level rotation, uh, 67 knots of, of your beast of R here. Uh, jumping to the, uh, the next example, and this is also in September, kind of having fun with these summer months here. Uh, this was uh, Wichita, Kansas, and uh, just west of town, uh, uh, there was a hailstone that was retrieved of 7.75 uh, inches in diameter, uh, but this was a very impressive swath of, of greater than four inches throughout its lifespan uh, west of the metro. And uh, again, we see uh, a nice tight reflectivity gradient uh, at the half degree out of the Vance radar site. Uh, again, a nice real strong uh, wide updraft indicated by uh, your B-Ware here uh, west of town. 
uh, all the way up to 36,000 feet too, so a pretty tall storm here that we're still seeing really good storm structure. And again, your mid-level rotation, your uh, rotational velocities of uh, just shy of 60 knots. So again, a real impressive storm here. This is eye candy, so we'll continue on here. Uh, go to Bo, Oklahoma, May 23rd, 2011. Uh, Derek and I know that well. It pretty much destroyed our car and caved in the roof. Uh, we can see here the half degree uh, storm structure on uh, out of Frederick. Uh, again, a nice tight reflectivity gradient. Uh, looking at the uh, mid levels, 23,000 feet again, uh, a wide, very nice, clean, wide updraft uh, that we can see there. And again, very impressive mid level rotation of, uh, of 75 knots of, of your rotational velocities. And the last example we have here is actually the day after near Timken, Kansas. Again, a six-inch hail-producing type storm. Uh, you know, not all that unusual from, again, types of supercells we see. Uh, again, a nice big wide updraft at 20,000 feet and, again, strong mid-level rotation. So I think the thing to take away from this is that a lot of times we won't see ground truth on, on some of these really impressive supercell storms. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it, at least if we go or, or approach uh, baseball size in the warnings, uh, we're at least doing a better job uh, conveying that, uh, that uh, really large, significant hail threat. Um, you know, again, ground truth may not always be available, but hopefully with these radar signatures, uh, hopefully with these radar signatures, we're able to, uh, to have a, a better conceptual model of the types of storms that might be favorable uh, for giant hail. So just in summary, uh, what we want again to see is a well-organized supercell structure, the presence of a really nice BWR, in combination with, again, a moderate or really strong mid-level mesocyclone. Uh, if it's resolved well, good strong uh, storm top divergence and uh, high reflectivity values throughout and above uh, that hail growth zone, those are the main keys that we're really looking for conceptually that we want to see uh, for giant hail producing type storms. Um, of course, we're completely limited by the remote sensing capabilities of what we have, so these methods oversimplify the, the very complex hail growth process that requires a lot of conditions that we just simply can't uh, resolve uh, operationally. Uh, but hopefully, uh, you know, this will provide some good framework to at least have a starting point. Um, you know, hail size forecasting has always been challenging. Uh, but hopefully that there's a few operational signals out there now that we've identified that will at least in, in, increase confidence putting in uh, either giant or maybe even four-inch hail in short-term warning operations. So I'm going to start concluding with that. Uh, uh, if you're interested, we did publish a paper about a year and a half ago in the Electronic Journal of Severe Storms Meteorology. It's online. It's available uh, for free to download and take a look. Uh, so I'd encourage anyone interested in more details uh, to, to check that out if you'd like. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email myself or any of the co-authors with any, with any uh, uh, questions you might have. And uh, also a long list of acknowledgments that uh, people did a, a wonderful job uh, contributing uh, to, our, to our research. Uh, George Phillips, uh, Jennifer Laughlin, Al Patrika, Amos Malioko, Roger Edwards, Ryan McCammon, Kyle Ortega, Les Lemon, Ryan Jewell, and Arthur Witt. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time today, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Uh, thank you, Scott, very much. Uh, fascinating work, a great example of uh, taking research and converting it into an operational uh, technique. OK, if you have a question for Scott, uh, the lines are open. This is John Kwiatkowski of Indianapolis. Uh, very impressive. Uh, do you think there's any way a correlation coefficient in the dual pull, I mean, uh, yeah, the dual pull could be tied in with this somehow? Because that can be pretty impressive for finding giant hail as well. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And uh, that's something that uh, Derek, myself, and a few other people uh, on this co-author list is, is looking at right now uh, through actually a, a field project called Hailstone that we're looking at. Um, the biggest challenge with, uh, with dual pole and, and doing a similar project to this is the low resolution of storm data. So what we really need to accomplish is having high resolution hail reports uh, with, with very strong confidence in the timing of occurrence. Uh, because even a five or six minute delay in a hail report is going to substantially alter 
uh, the, the location of where the hail report would be with those dual pole type products. So uh, I, I agree. I think uh, from what our preliminary work has shown, uh, hopefully correlation coefficient and, and maybe even to some degree ZDR uh, will provide some insight. Uh, at this stage, it's a little early, uh, I think, to, to determine if, if they're going to be good hail size discriminators. Uh, but certainly for detecting hail, we've, we've seen already that they're, they're very promising. Thank you. Hey, Scott, this is Ron here in St. Louis. Very nice presentation. Um, one question, you talk about the very strong mid-level mesocyclone. I guess at close ranges, too, you're not going to be able to see it that well, actually within 25 nautical miles or maybe 30 nautical miles, like you would see at distant ranges from the radar. You didn't mention anything about that. I understand your distant range issue very well uh, due to sampling issues, but at very close ranges, you know, the angle of the beam is well tilted and so forth. I was just curious, how, how close did you get towards the radar itself, basically? Hey, Ron, that's a good question. Um, yeah, we, we did actually throw out all cases within uh, 30 kilometers from the radar site. And then in cases where there wasn't a secondary radar to, uh, to resolve the, the mid-levels, well, uh, we had to throw out that case. Is, is it, was that your question? Or? Yeah, basically, the, how far from the RDA site out and you say three kilometers out, that's, that sounds very representative, basically, you know. So, so even, I think, sometimes I think it might be, have to be 35 kilometers out a little bit, too, just to detect that very intense uh, mid-level mesocyclone if it's, you know, up around, up around 15, 20,000 feet up there, particularly, and so forth, you know. So, but that's, uh, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable, your, your, your values, your, you are getting rid of some of the samples within three kilometers of the radar. That sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Hey, Scott. This is uh, Kevin Laws of Birmingham. Great presentation. Very timely for us, too, considering I'm going to meet with my insurance adjuster on Thursday at my house. Um, did you guys look at the difference? And I, I noticed you didn't put a lot of sounding material up there, even though you inferred it with the uh, worksheet. Did you guys look at the presence of a water-loaded updraft, say, versus what you boys out in the Midwest experience with some of that dry air coming along. Well, I've noticed that to be a pretty good discriminator and maybe a reason why we don't have nearly the reports in the southeast that you guys have in the Midwest. Yeah, that's that's something we, uh, we didn't probably look into in enough detail, and that is an interesting idea of maybe why you don't. I mean, certainly one of the things we see out there in the field is uh, you know, giant hail that starts falling and, and really heavy precipitation can even start the melting process quicker on the way down uh, with, with, you know, heavy type of precip cores. A lot of times uh, the giant hail is falling actually outside of that precip, at least in our nice, well-organized supercell storm structures, uh, the size sorting from the environmental winds themselves uh, like to a lot of times space out the, the giant hail from the, the, a lot of the other rain. Um, that's something that'd be interesting to look at. Uh, we didn't really look into to water loading a whole lot, so uh, yeah. If you if you see something with that, please let us know. We'd we'd like to hear what what you'd have with that. That's a good point you make too about the updraft downdraft separation with the supercell. I mean that's that's a key critical component. I think that a lot of forecasters kind of glance over. But uh, you know, in some of those storms we've had here recently, in fact, I've noticed the highest DB that we've ever, I've ever seen on radar was 78, and the best report we could get was golf ball, and that could have been some reporting issues, but again, that, I think that uh, it was also associated with a bow echo instead of a, a supercell, so maybe that does make a, a huge difference, so thanks again. Hi, Scott. This is Aaron from Dodge City. Uh, good talk, and I'll just comment this. You know this. I've been looking at uh, more of the environmental pre-storm uh, analysis with these events and uh, expanding. I've, I've got a national database I'll be publishing hopefully in the next year. But to uh, kind of answer some of the, the previous question, there is a, a connection with hail size as you go from a, a bend hail size of starting off like at a quarter size and then progressively getting bigger with precipitation efficiency and in particular with the, the concept of beneficial competition. So some of that precipitation loading uh, does have an association with hail size. In other words, as your precipitation efficiency and your precip loading increases, your hail size generally does decrease based off of, again, a pre-storm environment. And the other comment I had was, uh, you know, one thing I'm seeing, too, in the database I'm doing as a pre-storm is that 
you know, traditionally we've used uh, wet bulb zero and, and freezing level heights pretty strongly for calculation of 50 dBZ or whatever. I'm really seeing little to no connection with that and these larger bend hail sizes. Um, I'm just kind of curious to get your comments on that uh, with the, the radar perspective because it seems like we've been focusing in the wrong area as a kind of a precursor signal to, or at least a, a value to use to, to gauge our, our threat for uh, larger hail. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Yeah, you're exactly right when it comes to uh, 50 dBZ uh, echo heights compared to either the, like the freezing level or the wet bulb zero height. Uh, we looked at that. Uh, if everybody's interested, it, it's in the paper. Uh, but uh, essentially, you're right. There's there's very poor correlation when you're dealing with high end type hail events, supercell type storm structure. Uh, it seems the time that that really works the best for a 50 dBZ height versus some sort of environmental level is your your weaker storms, weaker shear, where it's a lot of times just updraft goes up, it does what it does, and hail comes down. Uh, when it starts getting more complex and, and you're dealing with uh, such as mid-level rotation and supercells that can accelerate and enhance the updraft stronger uh, than the buoyancy and the environment alone would provide, uh, that's when we start seeing uh, tremendous scatters all across uh, uh, our scatter plot, if you will, from looking at a 50 dBZ height versus a wet bulb zero height. Uh, there, there's tremendous overlap in, in those bends. So yeah, you're right. Uh, when we're dealing with highly organized supercell storm structure, uh, using a Donovan method or, or some other type of, uh, of linear threshold is, is probably not going to work. The Ville and Ville density slide didn't load for me. Would you mind throwing it up there again? Sure, no problem. Let me uh, go back. So your conclusion here was that you could get large hail and uh, the Ville not increase or the build density not increase? Yeah, we didn't see any correlation in, in either digital VIL or VIL density um, with hail sizes. In, in this particular graph here, both on the left and right, the, the green is the, uh, uh, the four inch hail and the uh, red would be your storm data two inch hail and vice versa on the shave versus uh, your four and two on the, on the blue and purple. And uh, yeah, there was just tremendous overlap. Uh, we didn't really see uh, any any real skill in discriminating actually hail size uh, on uh, the bill products. Hey Scott, on this as well, did, did you guys have to go back and recalculate digital bill? Because I know it's capped at 80. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we we uh, used exactly what you would see in in AWIP. So yeah, it was uh, there was no additional calculations uh, based upon what you would uh, ingest in AWIPs. Oh, I'm sorry, you're saying uh, your, your digital bill of 80, is that what you're referring to? Because I was thinking of your reflectivity capped, I think at like 50 or 56. You're referring to the digital bill? Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't digital bill take that cap off and, then, and, and, and also obviously increase the resolution? But I think the FAA requirements for digital bill was capped at 80, if I remember right. Yeah, that's possible. I'd have to go back and look. I know for the digital bill, we used a GR uh, analyst to, to get that, so uh, that might have been how we got around the 80. Uh, uh, that, that's a good point, okay, because GR analyst uses a different algorithm for digital bill than our AWIPS does, so that's a good point. Thanks. Well, that might explain why the bill density uh, doesn't correlate well if, if the uh, algorithm is different than what was used in that study. Because I think that study did show that uh, the, if you had large hail, you, you virtually always had a much higher bill density. Yeah, the, the thing I would say anything about bill, and, and you know, this is just my, my take on it, but uh, you're just probably not going to have much skill seeing any type of bill product with giant hail. Uh, you're, I, I, just, I don't think you're going to get, uh, you know, the bill is more calculated in a, a, a water-based versus ice uh, calculation. and uh, if, if you're if you're trying to use Ville alone for for hail sizes, it's it's probably not going to work out very well. Well, I'll uh, I would disagree with you on that, but go ahead. I, I appreciate you showing me the slide. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, just uh, last call for uh, questions before we conclude. Hello, Scott. This is uh, Greg Patrick in uh, Fort Worth. Did you look? Uh, any uh, kinematic characteristics with regard to uh, you know the wind profiles 
where the, some of the storms occurred? Because I know some of those examples you showed um, made me believe that maybe there were some unique characteristics with regard to where the uh, maybe the mid-level mesocyclone was located with regard to the low-level mesocyclone. So did you look at any of that at all in your, in your study, e even in something as simple as direction of movement or anything like that? Yeah, anecdotally, we, we did look at that. Um, Ryan Jewell had a, a really nice environmental database that he's put together, and honestly, I'd, I'd let him field that question better than me. Um, what we did see is certainly supercell type environments that you'd expect. Um, I can't recall, this was two and a half years ago when we looked at that, so I, I can't recall off the top of my head any real specifics on the kinematic side of things, but if you are interested, I, I, Ryan might be willing to share uh, that, that database that he's put together and uh, that, that might answer your question. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you, Scott, and I wish you all